commentator on Professor Dunn's talk is uh, Dr. Justin Barrett. Uh, Dr. Barrett is senior researcher at the Center for Anthropology and Mind and at the Institute of Cognitive and Evolutionary Anthropology at the University of Oxford. Uh, Dr. Barrett has published widely in the cognitive science of religion on such topics as anthropomorphism and God concepts, um, a topic actually that came up in the previous uh, session, theological correctness, uh, ritual intuitions, petitionary prayer, children's <coughs> assumptions about God's perceptual abilities, and why Santa Claus is not a God. Um, his work has appeared in such journals as uh, Child Development, Cognitive Science, Cognitive Psychology, Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion, Method and Theory in the Study of Religion, and Theology and Science. In his 2004 book, uh, Why Would Anyone Believe in God with uh, Altamira, presents a scientific account for the prevalence of religious beliefs. Justin. Thank you. I don't have control yet. Okay. Apologize. Now, yeah. all right. Uh, cognitive approaches to the study of religion arose out of the conviction that, as the cognitive and psychological sciences have matured over the past 50 years, an opportunity has been created to import insights, and sometimes the methods, from the cognitive sciences to help address problems in the study of religion. After all, when we concern ourselves with the nature of religious thoughts, attitudes, behaviors, rituals, socio-political organizations, and the like, we're focusing on human phenomena at many points modulated and mediated by human information processing systems, that is, cognition. Consequently, some questions in the study of religion will be usefully informed by what we know about the cognitive sciences. The label, Cognitive Science of Religion, or CSR, from my perspective, captures the scholarly projects that put characteristic features of human cognitive systems in a central place when trying to causally explain religious phenomena. In this sense, CSR is more of a research orientation than a genuine discipline or subfield. It is frequently complained that CSR is all about ideas or beliefs and ignores religious practices and experiences. Not so. Some of the earliest work in the area actually directly concerned religious practice and related experiences. I have in mind here the work of Robert McCauley and Tom Lawson considering, concerning religious rituals and that of Harvey Whitehouse concerning the effects of religious rituals on sociopolitical morphology. Likewise, the earliest published cognitive theory was Stuart Guthrie's new anthropomorphism theory, which Dr. Cohen has referenced, in which Guthrie argues that cross-cultural cross-culturally characteristic features of human cognitive systems frame our experiences of the world around us and sometimes lead us to detect the action or presence of gods. Note that implicit in Guthrie's theory is an important but often neglected insight. Experiences only become religious experiences because of a certain conceptual framework through which the experiences are processed and interpreted. Understand the conceptual framework the cognitive architecture, and you will better understand the experiences. This observation brings us to one of Professor Dunn's key points. Not only are experiences informed and constrained by the cognition we bring to the experience, but religious experiences, particularly those with great intensity or frequency, may inform the cognition available to us for subsequent experiences. Surely, how religious practice impacts cognition, broadly construed to include effective dimensions of information processing, must concern cognitively oriented scientists of religion. I must confess that, with the notable exception of White House, those of us falling under the CSR umbrella have had relatively little to say on this topic. In our defense, as most of us have been concerned with general questions of cross-cultural recurrence of religious expression, our explanations have necessarily focused on cross-culturally recurrent features of human cognition, including affect, and not those more variable aspects of cognition driven by culturally specific or even idiosyncratic experiences and practices. We have also focused more on religious phenomena as dependent variables to be explained rather than as independent variables to do the explaining. Nevertheless, I welcome Professor Dunn's corrective in this matter. These two emphases on the relationship between cogn cognition and experiences are likely to be mutually beneficial. 
if, as Professor Dunn suggests, religious traditions have hit upon particularly potent ways to shape cognition, then how they leverage these cognitive dynamics is likely an important mode in the transmission and evolution of particular religions. I should say that another Emory professor, our convener today, Professor McCauley, has given us theoretical timber for building this more comprehensive research program. He has observed two kinds of cognitive fluency and automaticity, or naturalness. One, maturationally natural cognition, arises largely due to cross-cultural regularities in the environment and biological endowment. Examples include basic numeracy, such as one and two make three, fluency in your mother tongue, and believing others' behaviors be guided by their mental states, what's referred to as theory of mind. The other type of cognitive naturalness is practiced natural cognition that arises largely through practice, rehearsal, explicit tuition, and culturally pe peculiar support. Examples include chess and algebra mastery and knowing how to negotiate a sit-down restaurant. It is this practice natural cognition that is built upon through special experiences and practices, including religious ones, and captures our scripts and schemata. Fusing Macaulay's and Dunn's insights with those common in CSR, we get a more complex relationship between cognition and experience. Common, largely fixed, maturationally natural cognition informs and constrains the formation of cultural or religious cognition, which falls into the category of practice naturalness, which in turn informs and constrains religious practice and experience, especially frequent or affect-laden experiences, then impact general cognition and cultural and religious cognition. While I welcome Professor Dunn's proposed program of examining how religious practices and experiences shape cognition, I'm less enthusiastic about the immediate promise of relying on the neurosciences to assist in such a program. And indeed, he acknowledges that this is a long-term project. Professor Dunn proposed that the intensity and perhaps the genre of religious uh, experiences regularly induced in religious contexts can have profound effects on the development, regulation, and the transformation of human cognition and affect. We may quibble about what intensity amounts to in this context or how profound the effects might be, but surely Professor Dunn's main point is on target. Our experiences, perhaps especially affect-laden ones, do change the way we think, feel, and act. My concern is this. Assuming that we want to understand the effects of experiences on human cognition and affect, particularly in a religious context, it is not clear to me that neurocorrelates are very helpful, at least at the moment. Is the greatest promise of the neuro side of neurophenomenology that neurocorrelates may help to identify genres and intensity of experiences if behavioral measures, including verbal reports, are ambiguous? If so, I wonder if valid ways of gauging intensity and genre from other cheaper, more portable, less disruptive, and more ecologically valid measures are possible that likewise would provide these signatures or profiles that help distinguish classes of experiences. For instance, blood pressure, pulse rate, salivary cortisol levels, galvanic skin response, pupil dilation, and, and verbal reports might all play a role. But perhaps, I've got that wrong. Perhaps physiological and behavioral measures are insufficient because brain states might give us clearer links to possible cognitive and affective outcomes of the experiences. If so, the neuro side of neurophenomenology may offer a characteristic signature brain activation pattern for classes of experiences in hopes that identifying such signatures will offer predictive and explanatory precision regarding how frequent, repeated, and or intense experiences might change cognition outside of that experiential context because of neurophysiological mechanisms underlying the experiences. For instance, uh, an experience with activation pattern, let's call it ABC3, may be found to facilitate subsequent cooperative thinking because area B, we'll call it, is involved with cooperative thought and is more readily activated because of its previous intense activation. Spotting these kinds 
of causal connections, particularly ones not easily anticipated by standard cognitive research, would be very valuable and exciting. Currently, researchers like Richard Sosis can take inspiration from Durkheim or from evolutionary psychologists to predict that collective ritual participation of a certain character and frequency will lead to more cooperative attitudes, and then go out and test these predictions using observation, economic games, interviews, or other sorts of behavioral measures, as he has done. But if our understanding of neural activation and plasticity is insufficient, is, sorry, is sufficient, neurophenomenology might enable us to understand otherwise inexplicable expertise cognition relations, such as if repeated bungee jumping facilitated cross-domain problem solving. Perhaps it does. And maybe just looking at the standard kinds of measures, we would never detect that or anticipate it. But by looking at the neuro, sorry, the neurophysiology, we might have perfectly good explanations for this kind of connection. Without understanding the neural changes involved, we might never be able to anticipate or explain such a surprising connection. If the neurosciences can deliver such insights, excellent, I'm all for it. Unfortunately, a number of problems have to be solved before we start reaping such a harvest of insights. For instance, we don't yet know how complex activations map onto phenomenologically or behaviorally meaningful cognition and affect. Such a search is likely to be slow and costly, because Professor Dunn is surely correct. Religious experience isn't just a product of a localized, specialized brain area or structure. If it is an it, it is complex and distributed. There is no God spot. And simple bottom-up mechanistic models are likely to be insufficient. We also don't yet know if phenomenologically similar experiences need be subserved by one and only one signature activation pattern. In fact, Professor Dunn su suggested that maybe they're, they're not. Could it be that the same sort of experience with the same knockoff consequences in terms of, of cognition and affect could be realized by more than one neural network in any given individual, let alone across different individuals? What the and we also don't yet know what the relationship is between complex activations and later complex activations in later contexts. For instance, pattern ABC3 might encourage cooperation because area B is typically involved in cooperation, but perhaps only if A is likewise activated in a particular way, otherwise cooperation is discouraged, let's say. Further, for such a neuroscientific research program to fulfill its potential with regard to religious activities that we see outside the lab, Brain activity measurement technologies have got to improve. Right now, we have no way of measuring a neurological signature for many of the types of context-dependent religious practices that people engage in. For instance, we have no way of measuring a neurological signature of the brains in young initiates, suffering from exposure and nutritional deprivation while they are whipped with nettles and forced to eat feces, or people marching across deserts on pilgrimage, etc. We can only manage meditation, prayer, and other stationary activities that can be performed even in a laboratory. Given these needed scientific and technological advancements, I have a recommendation. I recommend that scholars interested in the study of religion exercise patience. Leave this work to neuroscientists that figure out these problems for us until their tools are more amenable to our applications. It will take a little bit of time and it'll be worth the wait, I imagine. In the meantime, we, we need not fear. I suggest we develop Professor Dunn's research program anyway of examining how religious experiences shape cognition and affect using available non-neuroscience cognitive methods. Thank you. Once again, uh, before we open the session up uh, to general questions from both audiences, I'd like to give uh, Professor Dunn a couple of minutes to respond to Professor uh, Barrett's uh, comments. Thank you, uh, Dr. Barrett. Very interesting. I appreciate your comments. I find them very constructive. I'd like to say that, uh, first of all, I think your last comment is a good one in the sense that it is far too easy, even for neuroscientists, to take their own material and speak somewhat loosely about it in uh, layperson's terms in such a way that we imagine neuroscience to be far more advanced than it actually is. 
uh, and therefore it's, it's easy, the brain in a sense can become a sort of repository, a black box for the way in which we imagine all kinds of things to be working and we can latch on to some small piece of evidence to think that we've got a solution. However, I would say that I, I would uh, actually say that we can make we can make progress in the neuroscientific domain in this regard. It should not be not every uh, lab should engage in this type of work, obviously, and not every religionist should be engaged in this type of work, obviously. But I do think that there is still a very fruitful collaboration to be had between neuroscience and religion, specifically in the area of effective neuroscience. And um, I think, for example, there may be more progress in understanding the role of certain type uh, of certain brain signatures, dynamical signatures, and certainly certain brain structures in the pro in the production of affect uh, across subjects. And uh, one of the useful tools that can be employed in this context are individuals who can sustain a particular kind of affect under laboratory conditions. And that's what actually the initial motivation for working with the contemplatives in the Wisconsin study is that Richard Davidson is an effective neuroscientist and he's primarily interested in a sense in using the contemplative practitioners as uh, a part of the mechanism, if you will, because they can reliably, it appears, and ex is experimentally appears to be justified to believe that they can reliably produce certain kinds of effective states. Uh, effective neuroscience has advanced quite a lot in areas such as fear detection uh, and uh, in responses to uh, certain types of fearful stimuli, for example. I think that there's probably more advance in these areas than uh, we might all realize, and I'm not prepared to give you the details right now. Having said all of this, I think that the, my main point would be that uh, if we restrict ourselves to the study of affect in particular, that precisely because of the intensity of states that might be produced by contemplatives, they could be good partners for effective neuroscience as effective neuroscience moves forward. In a sense, they ramp up the signal beyond uh, what would be ordinarily observed in humans through usual mood inductions. And hence, they might give some advantage in certain types of uh, studies. I also agree, however, that this project can certainly move forward without the use of neuroscience, and it should move forward without the use of neuroscience. In fact, the findings of affective neuroscience can probably already be translated into, and I think, in fact, have been translated into behavioral tasks that can be done in the field. I'm not sure exactly the degree to which these are going to correlate with responses in the periphery, such as pulse and blood pressure and so on, well, this is a matter that uh, uh, I'm, I, I actually have no expertise to comment on. It's possible that this already po that one could already develop these types of studies. I would also urge, however, the notion that the uh, you had an interesting diagram up uh, at one point uh, that went by a little bit too quickly for my feeble mind. But I recall something uh, you started with: uh, what are maturationally natural concepts? And that, uh, this, uh, that you were trying to combine, uh, basically, Bob Macaulay's, uh, uh, some of Bob Macaulay's ideas with some of what I was proposing. What I'd like to say is that the way in which maturationally natural concepts may be transformed is not through encounter with an existing human cognitive schema, but actually initially through the practices themselves. In other words, what I'd like to, I'd like to suggest is that religious practices play a much more fundamental role in development uh, from the outset. And so in your diagram, I think I would suggest that uh, coming, where well, we're trying to look at the way in which uh, uh, matura maturationally natural concepts become uh, practiced natural concepts, we look especially emphasize uh, the role that practices play in creating cognitive schemas, not simply in reinforcing them. Uh, Along these same lines, I would say that a lot, there is quite a lot of interest in education in this regard. And some of it I find a little bit disturbing that we're going to somehow transform children. Uh, in other words, there, there are trends within the study of education in effective neuroscience, for example, in which we're going to learn a technique to inculcate pro-social behavior in children. Some of these techniques might even be drawn from contemplative practices like Buddhist compassion practices. There's a new center at Stanford University that's in part devoted to this. Uh, and uh, we're going to then 
promulgate this throughout the, the uh, classrooms of the world. I have some problems with this notion. There's something that's a little bit sinister about it, and I see, I think, Dr. Barrett having a similar reaction. So I think that we, uh, at the same time that we're engaged in the notion that there are going to be ways in which practices can induce certain types of positive behaviors, we also have to be very cautious about the possibility that they induce equally constrictive conceptual schema or that they are compatible with certain types of very constrictive and controlling conceptual schema. I think that's about all I had to say other than to thank you for your comments that I found very useful and constructive. <laughs>